Welcome to Salesology, conversations with sales leaders, the art of faster, easier, more profitable sales. When you're ready to transform your sales for today's transforming market, we've got you covered with your host, the queen of cold calling and founder of Salesology, award-winning author, speaker, sales trainer, and coach, Wendy Weiss. Hi, welcome to Salesology, conversations with sales leaders, the art of faster, easier, more profitable sales. And I'm your host, Wendy Weiss. I am the founder of Salesology and the Salesology Prospecting Method. I'm known as the queen of cold calling, and I have a fabulous guest here for you today, Tibor Chanteau, my friend and colleague, Tibor. Um, I've known Tibor for many years now, and we talk about prospecting all the time. So I'm going to give the formal introduction, which is that Tibor started in sales in the 80s. And uh, he started off on the phone. He's held almost every possible role in sales. And um, people sometimes call him a brilliant sales tactician. Uh, Tibor believes that sales is just about execution. And his work focuses on helping sales teams and organizations better execute their sales process. So Tibor, welcome, welcome. Thank you. I'm glad to be here, Wendy. How are you doing? I am fabulous now that you are here and we are talking. <laughs> Thank so, you. Yeah, well, we so always, I say we always manage to stir things up. So we, we do. We do. So I have to ask you, though, how did it all begin? All I know is you started in the 80s. How, how did you uh, start out? What brought you to this place that you are today? I'll tell you the real story. So, well, actually, you know, I did have a brief stint in the 70s uh, being on the phone when I was 14 for the Toronto Star, uh, the local newspaper, basically, you know, shuffling subscriptions. But that was really just truly what most most people hate, which is, you know, the old smile and dial, which is all it was. It was truly a numbers game. Um, but that allowed you to do certain calculations that help. And then, like most people, I don't think I was sort of accidental, but I was drawn into it. Um, in the mid-80s, I had bought a stock, and it did really well. And a week later, the same fellow gave me another tip, and I lost everything I'd made and a little bit more. So I figured there's got to be more to this than meets the eye. And I found out that you can get into the business to get your license, but you had to be working at a registered firm. And unfortunately, no, I wouldn't say unfortunately, let me reverse that. One of the building blocks of my sales success is that the first sales job other than the newspaper that I ever had was in a boiler room, as in the typical boiler room. And so when I realized that it was a boiler room, my conscience kicked in And when I got my license, um, I left there and I went to another place that was more acceptable. You know, it was on the nicer side of the street, even though what they were doing was no different than the other guys. But, you know, they were kissing you while they were doing it. So I continued there and I realized that the best way to, to make a living in that business was to sell, to move product, right? And that involved prospecting. And in the first place, that boiler room, you know, my job wasn't selling. Eventually, I did do that. But it wasn't selling, but it was finding prospects, lead generation. And we had to make 30 dials a day. And we had to speak 30 people. And the measure of speak, because this was before digital sort of trackers on the phone, the measure of speak is that you were on the phone for 90 seconds. So if it was 91 seconds, it was considered a conversation. If it was 89 seconds, it didn't rank against you. It was just considered a dial, right? So you have to make decisions because it's not like today where you go directly to the person on their mobile. You know, you, you were put on hold by the receptionist. You know, you were listening to Les Zeppelin by Ray Conniff, you know. So it was an adventure. And you really have to think about it at the 75-second mark as to what you're going to do with this call. So then when I was on the right side of the street, I continued my adventures. And eventually in the mid 90s, I ended up at Dow Jones. 
a known name. And there I climbed to the various ranks and I did different things. And eventually I became their director of sales strategy, really a fancy title, but my job was to develop a training program uh, because after the dot-com, um, what happened, the implosion in the beginning of the last decade is if you'll recall, there was the phrase right-sizing. Oh, yes. Which was really code for layoffs, right? Correct. And so we were a subscription business then, you know, this current stuff about being SaaS and subscription, that's all well and good, but we were doing that, you know, in the 90s. So, and in the early 2000s, as people were laying people off, you know, our subscriptions dwindled. And in Canada, that I, where I was the director, and in the Midwest of the U.S., where I was the director, we seemed to do better than the other regions. So they thought I had the secret formula. I pretend that I had the secret formula. I went out and learned some things about adult education. And, you know, when it was time to move back to Canada around 2004, I formed Rembor, which is the, the company that I currently run. Um, and again, you know, we can get into details, but that's how I got into it. So I wouldn't say quite accidental because I wanted to understand the financial markets, but sales is not what I envision. Okay. Uh, we all get here sometimes in very circuitous routes. I did too. I think so. So, I think um, so. so tell us about Renbor. What does your company do? Well, Renbor, you know, again, as you might imagine, the BOR part comes from my name and REN comes from my wife, Renee. So that's how we form Renbor. Um, so basically what I do is, again, as you said, I tend to form on tactics because, you know, the full extent of my tagline is execution. Everything else is just talk. And, you know, you know yourself, you go into organizations and there's a lot of energy at the beginning of the year. And then maybe we hit a little choppy waters or maybe we hit a good, you know, wind, you know, and we're like going and things are happening. And, and a lot of the strategy falls by the wayside because it's, you know, people are busy doing things. So I focus on what they're doing because if you're going to be doing things, if you do them right, it could actually support the strategy. So in many instances, you know, the first piece of work that I do is to actually aligning activity with the actual strategy that the company had, which if that disconnects exists, then your strategy is worth nothing and your execution is probably, you know, consuming a lot of energy that doesn't need to be consumed. Can you give us an example of a strategy that's not aligned and then the execution yeah, so suffers? Yeah, a very simple one. Um, and, you know, if people are interested, they can they can find the activity calculator on my website or when we will have the links or you can email me. But I find that if you sit down with a salesperson and this is what the activity calculator does and you ask them some simple question, five data points, right? The first one is, what's your target? What's your quota? What's your goal? Whatever word you want to label it, because people want to get stuck in semantics because they want, want to avoid the facts, right? So I don't care what you call it. What's your quota? What's your company expecting of you on paper, right? And you would be surprised that not 100% of salespeople can answer that off the top of their head. So the first disconnect is, is, you know, I know this is a family show, but how could they leave the house without that number top and center in their front lobe, right? To me, I don't understand that if you're in sales and you don't know what that number is. So the next number I ask him is, what's the value of an average client um, in the first year? Because again, with SaaS, that could vary as they're adding users and all that. So it's not like what's, you know, what's the contract worth, but you have a general view. I mean, everybody's talking about their CRMs and their stack and their schmack and all that, right? they should be able to measure what the average value, almost down to the penny. But even if you just use Excel, you should be able to measure it down to a neighborhood what your average deal is, you know, twelve to $14,000, right? For value of a client the first year. So if you know those two numbers, we're off to the races. But again, you'd be surprised how many people don't know those numbers. I don't know what your experience is, but people- I am you know, not they don't surprised. Know. I am not surprised at all. But yeah, I interrupted make... you, please continue. No, no, no. I think, you know, 
a thing that I do with teams, and it depends which side of the border I'm on that day, right? But let's pick on Canadians today. So I'll ask them who their favorite hockey player is, right? And they'll tell me. And then I'll ask them what their plus minus is, which is a relevant stat in hockey, right? And they'll tell you, like, down to the T, home game, away game, you know, this, that, which period, the whole nine yards. And then you ask them for their numbers, and it's like crickets, right? So how do you operate? Like, you know, what do you know you got to do that day? It's not like I got to show up in the office, smile, have a few coffees, and make some calls. And I know that's not what people do, but I'm sort of going to the edges. But, you know, so the next number I ask them is... Out of 10 proposals that you submit, like real proposals, not spaghetti proposals, right? But real proposals, 10 proposals that you submit that you believe have a relevant chance of closing. How many actually close in the current cycle? Not eventually, because we all go back and you should, but let's look at the current cycle. And again, a lot of them don't know what that number is. But, you know, again, let's say that number is 40%, four out of 10 proposals, close this cycle. And again, some will close sometime down the line, right? So we take the same question down the cycle of 10 people who actually enter into a discovery cycle with you, how many of them will take a real proposal, right? And then the last metric that we asked them for is out of 10 initial meetings, not calls, but initial meetings, how many lead to a discovery cycle? And again, So now, if you know those, you can begin to focus on your activity. You can begin to really focus in and say, you know, which of these numbers do I want to change? And in order to change those numbers, what activity do I have to do? How do I change my swing at the base? How do I change my stride in the 100 meters? And it could be little things that you focus on from an execution point of view. But to me, it starts with an alignment of, your top line, what's the company expecting of you? And then how do you achieve that? And there's only really one thing that you have to to really truly think about, which is time. So if you can change your activity, because you can't change time, 24 hours, 60 minutes, you know, I don't care what people say about this time management shit, it doesn't work, right? Because it's already managed, right? So, but what you can do with it is allocate it to the right activities. So if you allocate the right time to the right activities, then you have a good chance of achieving the goal that, that's at the end of that. But it's all got to align. And if you don't know, then you can't align. And if you're not aligned, then it's a bit of an exercise in being on a treadmill and not moving forward, you know? Absolutely. It's like I'm in New York City and I want to get in a car and drive to California and I don't have a map. And I don't have my phone, so I can't, I can't plug in the GPS and have it, you know, tell me where to go. It's like, if you don't know your numbers, what do you do? Yeah, so now with this whole trend of sales is not a numbers game, like, give me a break, you know, like, it, 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 you, if it starts with a quota, it's a numbers game. Yes. And, and one of the things that has always annoyed me about this sales is a numbers game, sales is not a numbers game. When it comes to telephone prospecting, people will say it's a numbers game, but what they mean is dial the phone hundreds of times and cross your fingers. There's like no no strategy there, no, no skill, no nothing, just dial the phone and cross your fingers. That makes me crazy when I hear that. You know, we then take those numbers, right? So let's say the, the, the calculator leads to the fact that you might need 18 initial meetings a month, right? So if you calculate that it takes me, say, an hour and 15 minutes to get an appointment, whether that's good or bad is secondary, right? I know that it takes me an hour and 15 minutes to get an appointment. So if I know I need, you know, eight appointments in a month, then I know I got to set aside some 10 hours strictly for the act of prospecting, right? And that includes research, getting lists together, and then hitting the phone, right? So if people then looked at that and say, okay, how can I reduce that 18 to say 16? Because if I could take two prospects out of the formula, and then you continue that down the cycle, but let's stick with this. 
that means that I've liberated, and I, I mean this intentionally, I've liberated two and a half hours in my month. Now, people can say whoop de doo but if I apply that two and a half hours to understanding my market better, to understanding why I was able to reduce that 18 to two and a half. So we take our clients right into the call, as I'm sure you do as well. You know, what's the beginning like? And then what are the objections that we're going to get? And then what do we do with those objections? Not how do we avoid them? I think there's an insane amount of time spent on trying to avoid objections. So if you could get that granular, which salespeople hate, but that's being professional, right? You know, if you can get granular, you know, your favorite baseball player is granular. They don't need the morning paper to tell them these numbers, right? They know it themselves. We all hear about, you know, those athletes, and it's not uncommon, who stay after the game because they realize that during the game, something was off. You know, Toronto locally a few years back, Kyle, what's his name? Uh, his name is always a tongue twister, but he was the big, you know, star here. And he stayed behind Lowry, Kyle Lowry. He stayed behind after a playoff game and, and was doing his shots, right? So how many salespeople do that? Like how many salespeople practice more off the field than being on the field? So when they get on the field, they're professional. So they know their plus minus they know their RBI. So you can get right into the call and ask yourself, what objection came and how could I have overcome that, right? But do most salespeople do that? I don't think so. Do most managers ask them to do that? That's the bigger problem. Yes, yes. And most salespeople create the problems that they're having by what they're saying. Because yeah. it's, kind of, it's kind of like real life. People respond to what you say to them. So if you're prospecting and you introduce yourself to a prospect who immediately says, I'm not interested and slams down the phone, you need a better introduction or a better list. I think before you even get to that, you need to like sit down and think about what you're doing, right? Like think about the arena that you're playing in, right? You know, not every kid who goes to Little League ends up in the majors. And there's a reason for that, because at one point, you know, going out with a girl is more attractive than going to practice or whatever the reason is. We all took, you know, musical classes when we were young and we gave up yet, you know, we wonder about what happened with Ian Anderson or Jimi Hendrix or whatever the case is, right? So they don't want to practice. And, and you know, the manager needs to make them practice, whether it's making calls. You know, with one company, we had the, we had the salespeople call the relevant title within their own company and try and pitch them, right? So, you know, you have to immerse yourself in this. And salespeople think that prospecting is dirty, whether it's like mud or immoral or whatever, but they think it's dirty. So they don't want to immerse themselves in it. But again, they play golf every weekend, right? And like, you know, they don't do any better, but one hole they got in one less swing and it's like, wow. But they don't apply that same thing to how they get the membership to the club. Well, there's a very insidious myth. I'm really glad we're talking about this because, you know, there is this myth of the born salesperson that somehow there are these people out there. They're just born. They like they know what to do. They know what to say. And this is a myth. And just like all the athletes that you mentioned, you know, uh, my first career was I danced in a ballet company. But I had to go to ballet class to learn how to do that. Yeah. You know, uh, elite athletes, uh, whether they're in the Olympics or they're playing pro sports, they don't just run out on the field and start playing the game because they're talented. They learn their craft. You know, it's interesting. You get these dialers today, right? And they got great scripts and all that. And these guys are sitting there. You know, I had one client. Their guys were sitting there on the bouncy ball and all that, right? And then all of a sudden a call came in their ear and they looked at the Salesforce screen as to who it was. And it was blah, 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 insert name. And they were wondering why their numbers were so bad, right? You know, a case like that, I wouldn't want to measure my numbers either. But, you know, they weren't really, they just repeated the same, you know, stuff to everybody just based on this quote unquote persona thing. But I think there's a couple of things that, 
sales organizations don't tell their salespeople that's a reality. And again, it's the arena that we play in that I tend to focus on. I think if you give them a sound foundation. So I tell them to picture a prospect that they currently are targeting, but they haven't spoken to as yet, right? But they're on their list. Like there's an expectation that they're going to, to reach out to them. And I tell them to picture that individual what their role in the company is, what their role in the decision is, because often that's different, right? You could have a lower level hierarchy making a larger level decision, right? And, you know, so who is this individual? You know, what's their role in the company? What's their role in the decision that you would have them make? And then ask how many other decisions are they involved in, right? So, you know, if they're an HR person, there's like, you know, diversity, there's the disability element in terms of access, there's hiring, there's firing, there's courses, there's fitness, there's blah, 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 right? So you can imagine how much this individual is involved in. And then nothing today is a standalone product. Everything is integrated into something else. If you have Salesforce, you probably have like, if you're a big company, you have SaaS. Uh, SAP and other things. So everything is plugged into something else. And, you know, you got this salad of things, right? So each of those plugins has how many viable competitors? Let's say in an average deal, two or three, right? And lo and behold, each of those guys has a salesperson. So I ask them, you know, how many interruptions do you think this person gets on a daily basis? If we just look at LinkedIn, email and telephone. Right? And I leave them to come up with a number. So I'm a simple guy. So I come up with five, right? So if they get five interruptions of this sort per day, and let's stick to the telephone because what, that's what you and I like, right? So as you said, if they get five interruptions a day, they're not interested. Well, let's work that out. That's 25 interruptions a week. And if they, you know, an average person, 48 weeks a year, that's 1,200 of those phone calls. Again, let's stick to just the telephone, right? And then if they've been at that job, not necessarily at the same company, but if they've been procurement manager for the last five years at major financial institutions, they've been at that job for the last five years. For the year, it works out to be 1,200 interruptions. For five years, it works out to be 6,000. 6,000 of the same shit they've heard, you know, for the last 5,999 times. So that's the first thing they got to deal with because there's a lot of triggers there. As soon as I remotely sound like the last 5,999, I'm going to suffer the same fate, right? So the first thing you have to think about is how are you going to put together a script that's going to at least, at least give you a chance to get past it. Now, there's also good news. I found some stats, you know, from a company, you know, and they had an agenda. They're trying to sell wireless, right? But they showed it was a a business uh, wire release that unrecognized calls. So that means it's coming from unidentified numbers, right? Have 31 seconds. So what I try and encourage my clients is you can do a lot of damage in 31 seconds. So you can communicate a good message if you craft it well. But if you call up with the same whatever expletive you want to use, right, that the last 5,909, why do you expect that you're going to, you know, and they're all writing it together at the club, right? They're all comparing their stacks and they're all, you know, so every, you know, every email you get is the same, every LinkedIn you get is the same, and every phone call you get is the same. So, the first step is to understand the arena that you're in, that you have to, somebody that's already, you know, we talk about people being behind the eight ball. They're trying to pack 16 hours into a 10 hour day. Their wife's on them because it, they haven't been to little league in a couple of weeks and all that. Right. That's what you're fighting. It's, it's not about getting them to understand why you're better than product X. It's getting them to stay in the call. That's the first thing. Yes. And that's where they miss the ball. Like they, I love the guys who call me and tell me their full title. Like who cares? You know, like. <laughs> yes. I, I, I want us to dive a little bit deeper into this about uh, how, to, how to handle that initial 30, 31 seconds. And if you're a manager, how to uh, work with your team 
so that they can handle those initial 30 seconds. Um, we're going to take a short pause here for a word from our sponsor, Salesology 3X Appointments. Um, you know how frustrating and stressful it is when you leave every sales meeting wondering if your sales team knows how to sell because they're not selling and all you ever hear from them are excuses. They blame your marketing. They say you need to do more on social media. They say you need a new website and you know something is wrong, but you don't quite know what it is. And you're even starting to wonder if it's you. Well, you don't have a lot of options here. You could fire them all and start from scratch and that would be expensive. Um, you're sick of waking up every night wondering how to fix this. Well, imagine instead that you have an easy to use replicable system that ensures your team can easily schedule qualified appointments. And imagine that your team is excited and motivated, no more excuses, and you feel good. Salesology 3X appointments can make that happen. So if you're a business owner or a sales manager with an underperforming sales team, let's talk. Click on the link to my calendar in the show notes, schedule a time, and I look forward to meeting you. And we are back with Tibor Shanto talking about prospecting, my favorite topic, and uh, what to say when a prospect says hello. You get that prospect on the phone. You have 30, 31 seconds. How do you maximize that time and not sound like everyone else? Okay. So I, want, I invite anybody that takes offense to anything I say, anything I say to, to contact me directly and so on. But I will insist to the grade that it goes like this. So you have to put yourself, you know, what's the oldest thing in sales? What's in it for me, right? So, you know, it doesn't matter how cute you are, how great your product is or whatever, you have to communicate to the customer in 31 seconds why they should stay on the phone, right? Why they should give you the first objection, which you're going to get. So let's, you know, no, I can't give you a script that they're not going to get, that you're not going to get an objection to because you're an interruption and that's the first wave that you have to get over. And that's why you have to do the things we're going to talk about now. So taking ourselves out of the equation, you have to ask yourself, again, that person that we pictured, you know, how many decisions he or she are involved in and, you know, all the pressure and all the energy that comes to that, you know, you have to ask yourself, what's top of mind for them, right? You have to ask yourself, you know, they're stuck in, you know, in Toronto, I use the busiest highway, which is Don Valley. We call it the Don Valley Parkway, as a par parking lot as opposed to to the parkway. So if you're stuck there at 8.30 in the morning, you're not getting to work on time, right? So what's this individual that you're trying to get to make a decision thinking about on that busy highway, whatever city you're in, picture the busiest, most clogged highway that assures that you're not going to get to work on time if you're stuck there at 8.30. What are they thinking about, right? They're certainly not thinking about product, right? In my case, they're not sitting there going, shit, I got to get some sales training. They're, talking, they're thinking about how far they are from quota and what, you know, the certain causes of that are and so on. But they're not thinking about what I'm going to deliver. They're thinking about outcomes, objectives, right? And that's what I focus my clients on is objectives. The, the whole formula is called objective-based selling. So what are that what is that person trying to resolve in their mind this could be a plus or a minus it doesn't always have to be a pain 70 percent of uh, customers are in the status quo right they're down doing their thing they're not thinking about buying they're just thinking about how they get to next month and again let's not put it in the negative it's not always pain they've got a plan they're executing they're working they're doing good you know, that's why they're not in the market. They're not like that 10% who's desperate for any help that they can get. So that's one of the other things. You got to leave pain and sort of solutions out of it because you have to connect with the person's objectives. And that's a higher level conversation than sort of, you know, product features and all that usual stuff, right? And even the conversation around value, how do you define value? You know, if you can't get that meeting, you know, we work on our clients to actually have a definition for value, one that they can share with their prospects, right? In that initial call, if they have the opportunity, if not in the initial meeting. But back to the call, right? So if you're going to introduce yourself and talk about all about your company and all that, 
sounding like 5,999 before me, I'm going to give you the objection you can't overcome and it's goodbye, you know, back to reality, right? So what I have to do is change that. So instead of introducing myself, I think, of, I think about dangling in front of them. And when, when I teach the thing, I literally grab the thing that I clean my glasses with and I do the image of dangling. You got it? Because you're not going to have a head-on you know, communication. It's like a drive-by shooting. You know, people think they're having an intellectual exchange with that prospect in the first 10 seconds. No, man, you're hanging on to the tail of that train, hoping to get on so you can actually talk. So talking about myself and who I am and what I do is irrelevant, right? What I got to talk about is what are the objectives that this person might be thinking about that I have a track record in resolving? So when I call a prospect, I'll go, hi, Wendy, my name's Shanto. You probably don't know me. I'm with a company called Rembor, but VPs at Bell Mobility, Canada Post, and XYZ, you know, something relevant to them, use me to increase activity in their pipeline, shorten their sales cycle. And, you know, Wendy, what they tell me is in the process, they've been able to get more accurate forecasts. I'm curious, are you, hmm, my tongue is stuck. Well, on the phone, I'm much better. I'll ask a question along the lines. I'm curious, uh, do you have any initiatives along those lines, right? So I'm putting a focus on outcomes, right? So the outcome is better pipeline activity, shorter sales cycles. Every VP wants a shorter sales cycle. What's interesting is I don't believe in a shorter sales cycle, right? They're hoping that if they can close things in four months, they'll close more deals, which is bullshit. They need more prospects and they need to know their numbers. And if a prospect takes six years to close, if you can predict it and manage that process, then it doesn't matter how long it takes it to close. The length of the sales cycle is secondary to the number of opportunities that are moving through your pipeline from top end to bottom end. So this, this, this fixation on time, I think, is not necessary. But I can't have that intellectual exchange on the phone, right? I do know how to shorten sales cycles because there's certain things organizations do that impede their people from actually executing faster, executing more smoothly, you know, if you know what I mean. So I know how to take time out of a cycle, but there's an optimal as opposed to shortest, right? But I use that as a hook, right? I'm trying to dangle some things that I'm hoping they were thinking about on the highway. Short, short and sales cycle, that will attract a different reaction from that person than talking about, you know, whatever feature I think of my product works, right? That person might say, you know what? I'm getting beat up on my forecasts every month, right? So this, might, this dangling thing might catch their eye. And asking a question, just being focused to it. Now, you have to make adjustments. So if I'm dealing with different industries, if I'm dealing with industries that I know traditionally have high turnover, I'll take the forecast bit out and I'll put in, you know, the turnover. And clearly you want to change your reference companies to stuff that makes sense to them. So you do have to think about it. It's not like change the name and go. But if you know your target, and again, unfortunately, after 18 years, you do have a list of clients, right? So you can generally find a good fit. But I think the more important is not the companies that you've dealt with. You know, again, you deal with companies like Bell Canada, it's a nice halo, but you still have to prove yourself. And I think in a prospecting call in that 31 seconds that we're talking about, if you can put out their objectives that you are willing to bet they were thinking about on the highway that morning, then you have a chance of one of those clicking and then building on that. If somehow you've missed, right, because we're not all perfect, it's not about perfection, it's about, you know, but if somehow you've missed, the question will generate an objection, and then we answer objections again with outcomes of objectives. So we don't take it as a call to battle, which most salespeople do, Ah, the you know, he objected, I'm going to go after him, right, kidnap his kids, right, it's not about that. An objection is obviously an opportunity to explain something that somehow was missed in the call. And what do I explain? I explain objectives and outcomes that I've been able to achieve for similar people, but I put an emphasis on things that I know are real. So in large companies, you know it yourself. If you're likely to call a large company today 
an offer a training regimen like we do, they either have an in-house, you know, learning and development, or they're already dealing with a third party like us, right? Right. So you know yourself, it doesn't matter what the flavor, you're going to get status quo. So you got to step back and say, okay, let's say we're dealing with learning and development, right? What are some of the objectives and what are some of the realities and what was learning and development thinking about on the highway? Because now you're not selling to a sales VP. You have to take it to the learning and development. What were they thinking about on the highway that morning? So one of the things that I've come to learn by talking to learning and development is that often one of their concerns, potentially fears, you fill in the blank, right, is that the result of the training that they're doing isn't reflected in the numbers because of lack of adoption, right? So if I'm up against a learning and development person and they tell me we already have a prospecting program, I'll say something to the effect that, you know, I know exactly what you're saying because Business Development Bank had a similar, you know, view before they saw how our process helped them increase adoption of internal programs. So I didn't go for a bake-off with the program they have now because on the phone, I lose that bake-off, right? Correct. But if I... <laughs> But if I focus on an objective that they were thinking about on the highway, holy cow, how do I measure this? How do I prove to management that they should have a learning and development department because we can't show the numbers and this guy has the secret formula, not for prospecting, but for increasing adoption. So they're inviting me in to find out how they're gonna increase adoption. That's part of the overall prospecting program. So that's what I sell. You know, and there's so many ways you could do that if you actually just step back and understood your craft, not you, but the audience. I didn't mean it that way. And, you know, what they say to VPs, they claim to meet VP after VP after VP, and they don't learn, you know, how to take some of those and, and, and make better calls. You know, and, and they keep going back to the product. You know, when I meet with a VP of sales, and once we get through the small talk and all that crap, you know, one of my first questions is, you know, I'm curious, Wendy, you know, how much of your current revenue comes from existing customers versus brand new customers? And they'll give me a number like 90, 10, 85, 15, some number like that. I'll go, that's wonderful. You know, I'm curious, you know, if we looked at your 2022 plan, what did you project? And it's always 80, 20. I don't know if it's a university thing, but it's always 80, 20, right? So right away, I've got a gap between where they are, which is 80, 85, 15, and where they want to be, the objective, right, which is, you know, the 80, 20. So again, rather than talking about what I do, let's talk about what they do and help them make the sale for themselves. But I tend to look at objectives and outcomes that they're thinking about, because even if they're status quo, like even if they didn't consider speaking to someone like me. If I dangle the right objectives in front of them, I could generate a conversation and ultimately that leads to a sale. And I've done that time and time again, where I've called people who had no inkling of buying a prospecting program that morning. It's not like they were even thinking about it on the highway, right? They had no inkling, but I hit the right objective. We're able to go for it. And, you know, you have a conversation and I think, that's the other thing that people are, are, are lacking is once that person wants to engage, they go back to features and stuff like that. Yeah. And what I see a lot, piggybacking on what you're saying, it's not just the salespeople that are talking about the features or talking about this product or that product. It's often the managers that think it's about the product or the features. Um, so, and I, there's another question that I do want to ask you, because this is something that I, that, that I see a lot. Um, it's my very firm belief that a lot of uh, the issues that come up down the line, once mm -hmm. they've, they're having that discovery call or the sale is in process, supposedly, can be the problems can be fixed by better prospecting. Because if that initial call is not handled correctly, 
then it, the foundation is not there and everything falls down or you risk having everything fall down. And I, I wonder if you could speak to that. Well, you know, if we were on video, you, your audience would be seeing me <laughs> nodding up and down, you know, my head's almost falling off because I agree with you hundred percent. I've always, you know, I've always said that a good prospecting call while, while executed leaves the prospect more anticipating the call than not. And you can go into that initial discovery call with good momentum, right? And that's one of the challenges that I see out there is people are so single, like there's one concept that they're working on, right? And generally it's a pain, right? So if they get the appointment, the appointment is really prove it, right? There's no expanded discussion. There's like, you said your product can do this, show me. Slice that cheese thinner than the last guy, right? Because that's what the phone is. We do this problem. We have this solution. Okay, come in, show me your solution. They demo right away. They love to demo. It's a four-letter word, but they love it, right? So they slice the cheese thinner and bam. But if they can't slice the cheese thinner, they're out. I would argue agreeing with you 100%, right? So this time I'm building piggybacking on you that, by dangling those objectives, right, I can expand the conversation, right? Because I can explore which of those three really connected. Was it the forecasting? Was it the, you know, shortening the sales cycle? Was it the pipeline activity? And pipeline activity, I can subdivide in a number of different topics. So I can have a great discussion without ever having to talk about what I do, right? And those are the best ones is when they come to their own conclusion that, you know, they got to hire you. Like you got to look at what you're doing from the time that you pick up the phone is that you have to give the client therapy. If that person doesn't feel you, you're not going to get the appointment, right? And if you get the appointment and they feel you on the appointment and, you know, I don't mean to sound like an old hippie, but I think people will get it then that first call is going to be great because you've left them with something that they're curious about, right? And then you can come in, you can hit that build on it and grow and sometimes close and sometimes not. I, I love this conversation, Tibor. Um, I do want to ask you, hmm. where can people find you? If this, if this conversation with Tibor Shanto has resonated with you, where do people find you? And, and we will post this in the show notes. Well, I recently moved, so there's a great pub down the road. So, you know. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, but I think if they don't want to travel, uh, the best thing is uh, tiborshanto.com. So if you take my first name, last name, put it together, add a .com to it, you'll find more than you'll ever want to know. Okay, and we will post that in the show notes. And you also mentioned uh, when we were just chatting before, uh, that you have a, a gift yeah, about the voicemail. Activity. Well, the voicemail one, yeah. People can go to the seven-day voicemail challenge. Just put that in Mr. Google, and you'll find a uh, free seven-day program. Well, it's not free. Let's be honest with each other. These days, nothing is free. I'm going to ask for your email, but I'm not going to spam you because I'm having a very lazy summer. So, um but if you go there, um, you can find the activity calculator, but uh, we're talking about the voicemail challenge, right? So if you put in the seven day voicemail challenge, as I was telling Wendy, it's my approach to voicemail. A lot of people don't like it, but those who try it seem to love it. So, you know, it's up to you. Again, it's down to execution. Um, you, can even, you can either do it over seven days as I initially constructed it, because that gives you, you know, each day an opportunity to build on things, or you can jump right in and Netflix it and do it in the course of about two and a half hours. But okay. I would, I, it's a great way to, to sort of go back to some of the things that I mentioned, because it, again, nothing replaces preparation. Um, but uh, yeah, the seven day voicemail challenge, you'll find it online everywhere you go. And uh, for our listeners, you do not have to Google it because I'm going to make Tibor send me the link and we will put it in the show notes. I will so, do that. Okay. So before we finish, Tibor, please put your hand over your heart and promise me that you will come back so that we can continue this conversation. Definitely. I'm always pleased to talk to you. I always come up with different things. And, and the other thing that I enjoy, again, is that I think... 
prospecting has taken sort of a wrap. You know, it's always in and out. I always say that, you know, I call myself a cold calling zombie because every time I think they think they killed me, I come back, right? So it's good to have other people in the battle with me. So I always enjoy these conversations. Absolutely. Thank you. And uh, so I want to invite all of our listeners to check out the show notes for all of Tibor's links uh, on prospecting. Uh, They're going to be in the show notes. Share us on social media. Tell your friends. Give us good reviews. And uh, thank you for listening to the Salesology Conversations with Sales Leaders podcast. And till we meet again, do visualize yourself surrounded by cash, really large bills. You've been listening to Salesology, Conversations with Sales Leaders, the art of faster, easier, more profitable sales. Be sure to follow so that you don't miss a single episode. And while you're at it, please leave a rating and review and be sure to share it with your friends. Tune in every week for more exciting insights and wisdom on transforming sales. And until next time, visualize yourself surrounded by cash very large bills. Mm -hmm.